What would you do if the unthinkable happened? How could you go on with life if your child died? How would you feel? How could you possibly deal with the pain, the loss, the devastation? Would you know where to go for help? Could you possibly find hope in the face of such grief? Welcome to the Dr. Gloria and Dr. Heidi Show. This show is brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation with the mission of helping people find hope after loss. And now, Dr. Gloria and Dr. Heidi. Hello, I'm Dr. Heidi with my mom, Dr. Gloria. We are both psychologists and experts in grief recovery. Coming up, we will answer these questions and many more. Yes, today we'll share with you information from some of the foremost experts in the transformational power of grief. Experts who, like us, have not only talked the talk, but have walked the walk. Yes, Mom, hi. Our first guest today is Dr. Ken Druck. Uh, Ken's an amazing guy, isn't he? He is, and he is the founder of the Jenna Druck Center. And, you know, I love Ken because Ken fills stadiums with his message of transformation after loss. Yeah, he lost his daughter Jenna in a bus accident in India, and she was on study abroad, and he's gone on. Well, he was well known before she died mm -hmm. and had written a tremendous book on men, been on Oprah, been on all sorts of shows, and he's gone on to dedicate his life and his work into Jenna's memory and has written a great new book. Yes. In fact, I have it right here. His book is The Real Rules of Life, Balancing Life's Terms with Your Own great book. So, and then our next guest is going to be Patricia Loader. And Patricia is the, as you remember, the director of the Compassionate Friends, the executive director, and you're on their board. Right? I was going to say, I definitely know Pat very well, <laughs> and I do remember her. Yes, I am on the board of the Compassionate Friends, and Pat, again, is someone that has completely transformed her life after great, great adversity and loss. Yeah, it's an amazing story Pat mm -hmm. brings in. Uh, she brings such spirit to people because she lost both her kids in an, uh, an accident where she was hit by a high-speed motorcycle and killed her two children, Stephen and uh, Stephanie. And mm -hmm. uh, she's gone on to just transform her life and other people's, and it's going to be exciting to have her on the show today. Absolutely, Mom. And I've just got to say, you know, can you imagine losing your only two children in a car accident suddenly they're gone at five and eight years old and going on eventually to be the executive director of the largest grief and loss organization in the world yeah an amazing thing and then mm -hmm. we're going to have Chris Donahoe on and Chris is an amazing singer and I know it's dear to your heart it is Chris is very near and dear to my heart because he does everything in the memory of his brother Terrence, and I do all my work in the memory of my brother Scott. Right, and my son Scott, we both mm -hmm. do that. And uh, so Chris is very inspiring, because I know that you feel like that sometimes uh, siblings kind of get some short shift, right? We do. Sometimes we're overlooked and unacknowledged, and our loss sometimes can take a backseat to the, the death of a child. So I'm here to be kind of that voice to say, you know what, we hurt too, and these were our siblings. And I love Terrence's story, because Terrence... As he was dying, he died of MS, and as he was dying, he lived life to the fullest, and he had such gratitude, and he taught us to, to love life even, you know, when you're dying. Absolutely. It's a great story. So why don't we get started with our guests? Okay, that's great, Mom. I'd love to do that. Oh, you know, before we get started, uh, I want to show a video of Dr. Ken's center, the Jenna Druck Center, and I want to just show that for a minute, and this is dedicated to Jenna. And then after that, we'll introduce Dr. Ken. Very good. Great idea. But before we get started, I want to talk about our audience. We've got a fantastic oh, yeah, audience, so audience here today. And a lot of them are bereaved parents and bereaved siblings, and we want to thank everybody for coming uh, to the show today. It's absolutely amazing that they were out here tonight to uh, join us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Because like you said, the people in this audience have walked the walk. They've lost siblings. They've lost children and they've gone on to transform their lives. And they show us basically that although our losses may define our lives, they in no way destroy our lives. Absolutely. So we want to thank everybody for being here today, and let's see the video. Okay. The Jenna Drug Center, a story of the resilience and love of a family and community as they responded to a tragic loss. A story of the strength and hope that was created as they planted the seeds to honor a special life and continue an important legacy, turning grief into hope and strength into leadership. I was lucky enough to be the little sister of Jenna Druck. 
She was one of my heroes. Jenna knew that this was the ride. This moment counted. She cared about what was happening in society. She had a profound sense of social justice and compassion for all people. Jenna could be described as a girl who never wasted a moment of her life. During the adventure of a lifetime, Jenna was traveling and studying abroad with Semester at Sea. On the way to the Taj Mahal, she was in a fatal bus accident. Her life on this earth cut far too short. Her spirit lives on through two highly acclaimed programs, transforming thousands of lives each year. Families Helping Families is a unique program that offers support services and education, a lifeline of hope and support to countless families during the days, weeks, and months following a loss of a cherished loved one. The Families Helping Families program helped me find the strength and courage to turn my grief into hope after losing my precious son, Matt. Now I'm able to help others navigate that difficult and painful journey that begins when someone you love dies. Learn more at jennadrugcenter.org. Wow, what an amazing show. And now let's introduce Dr. Kent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. 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 Well, Dr. Ken, it's so great to have you on the show today. So good to be with you. I'm so delighted to be doing this with you. It's so wonderful because, uh, as I said, uh, we have wanted to bring this message out of hope and recovery mm -hmm. and resilience after loss, and you really personify that. Well, here you are. You've created an amazing environment for us to have these conversations, which, as we all know, are shunned. It's like nobody wants to talk about this. So mm -hmm. where do people begin to go? Where are the resources? How do we find out about how we survive? And then how do we go on? Mm -hmm. And it's because of conversations like these. And Jenna was such an amazing kid. I mean, we were talking before the show, and I was like, she did so much in the short life that she had. I mean, by 9, she was winning awards. By 14, she was speaking to audiences publicly. I mean, she was an amazing, amazing kid. Yeah. Jenna, uh, Jenna was the most amazing person I've ever met. I've met some extraordinary people in this lifetime, and my daughter happened to be the most extraordinary person, and she mm -hmm. was uh, an E.T. I don't know what planet she came mm -hmm. from, I don't know where she came from, but she took the world by storm, and she, what she did in 21 years indoors. So uh, her, her programs, the Jenna Drug Center, and her spirit. She is our chief angelic officer. She is our CAO, I love that. I our love CAO that. so she's working it from the other side. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's good. Fabulous. Well, Ken, can you tell us a little bit about the experience? I mean, I'm sure our audience is wondering out there. I mean, how? I mean, she died in India, going to get her mm -hmm. body, yeah. doing all those things. That must have been unbelievable yeah, for the, you. You know, the, the phone rings the day before we lost her. Mm -hmm. Dad, I can't believe it. Tomorrow I'm going to go see the, the symbol of eternal love, wow. the Taj Mahal. Wow. And she's on the study abroad trip, and they're going around the world. Mm -hmm. And they're going to come home May 15th. They're all coming home, yes. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, the next day, the bus is on one of the most treacherous roads in the world. Uh -huh. And the bus flips over, and Jenna and three other beautiful young women die. And so the phone rings at 10 o'clock at night. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the fear that most of us carry somewhere deep in our spine mm -hmm. that we never even acknowledge. It's the unspeakable, unthinkable. And so in, in a moment, my life as I knew it ended and every cell in my being turned inside out. And it, you know, it's, it's a kind of frozen in time moment where we know our life has ended and we notice there's still some part of me that's alive. What am I, what am I gonna do with the part of me that's still here? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and how are you gonna the live journey. the rest of your life that's without right. Jenna in it? That's right, and how, why would I want to right. if, if it hurts this much, if there's this much pain? It, what kind of a sentence is this? What kind of cruel joke is it that I'm going to get to live out the rest of my life without Jenna? It's unthinkable. It's unspeakable. Mm -hmm. But from those moments where we can only survive one breath at a time, and thank God we have, we're have we surrounded by angels. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are surrounded by who in their own helplessness 
say stupid things to us, mm -hmm. say things that are insensitive. But thank God we're surrounded by people who show up and are angels. They breathe for us. And when it, we, it's when kind we of can. interesting. Some of the people that you thought would show up don't, and then some of the people that you haven't never even knew become yeah. your best friends. How does that work? Mm -hmm. You know, really, but, really something. But th that's one of the things that changes, and we experience it as as a kind of a loss because it's like, wait a minute, you're my best friend. Right. Or, you know, and you're and you're trying to put a spin on it, you're trying to fix me, you're disappearing, you're missing an action, and so we experience it as another loss. And it's important to balance that with understanding that we also can be grateful for the angels that show up. And some people just, mm -hmm. they just can't show up. It's too hard for them. Our pain is overwhelming for them. Absolutely. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about your book, mm -hmm. The uh, Real Rules of Life, Balancing Your Life. Um, Balancing life's terms with your own. Mm -hmm. That's the guy on the balance thing. Yeah. It's cool. So uh, we picked out about four rules of life um, that we wanted to talk about with you. And um, let's see. What are some of the ones well, that you, you think know, are most? Well, you know, yeah. first of all, the, the you know, I'm sitting here a couple of years ago, and mm -hmm. I've been doing Jenna's Foundation 70 hours a week for 14 years. And I'm saying, and I can hear both my angel and earth daughter saying, Dad, get a life. Mm -hmm. You've got wow. to step back, and you can also, by stepping back from the day-to-day -day a little bit, you can also touch the lives of more people. Mm -hmm. So I tried to distill the essence of everything I've learned about how life really is. Mm -hmm. No illusions, no misconceptions. How is life really? And how do we survive? How do we turn an adversity, a loss, wow. a setback into something, a personal and spiritual good in our lives. That's, that's what so I think is interesting because is. you start out in the book talking about how you're basically at the bottom and you, you, you're very angry and your life is basically feeling like it's been destroyed and then how do you transform and move yeah. out of that? Yeah, and we all have a process. We're also different. Mm -hmm. Some of us process, we're, we're quiet and silent, but we're, our process is working and that needs to be respected. Some of us need to talk and we need to, we're ready for a support group. We're ready to come to a compassionate friends meeting. We're ready to go to a families helping families program. So we all have to respect that we process differently, mm -hmm. especially in our own families. But we have to find a process because unprocessed grief turns into a deadness, a dullness, displaced anger. We start biting other people's noses off. It turns into indifference for the pain of others. Mm -hmm. But processed grief turns into what? Compassion. Right. Compassion is your pain in my heart. So we have to process it. And one of the things we have to come face to face with is that life isn't fair. So that's that's one of the that's rules. One of the rules, yeah. life, life isn't fair. Isn't fair. Right. And paradoxically, mm -hmm. it's more than fair. Let me say okay. how it's more than fair. Huh. It's more than fair. What are we doing here? We're breathing air. We're spinning through space. We're on a tiny little speck of a planet. Life, the idea of life is preposterous. Life is more than fair. With these blessings, we can love, we can communicate. We can communicate to millions of people maybe watching this in different parts of the world where, whose hearts are hurting. Mm. So life is more than fair in one sense, but in another sense, life is not fair at all. Okay. That we have no exemptions. You know, mm -hmm. I thought I was special. I thought I had a deal kind right. of with, you know, I, I got a deal. I'll be a good guy. I'll be a wonderful father. I'll do mm -hmm. all the right things and my kids will be protected. Right. Doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. No deals. So right. we're, none of us is special. None of us has an exemption card. Yeah. None of us is, you know, we're all going to go through life and we don't get to play God. Mm -hmm. We do, however, get to make choices eventually. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, we're in that time of choicelessness. We're just, re we're hanging on and fighting our way back into life. Right. But at some point, we do have choices about so, so, how we process. So bad things happen to good people, and yes. there are a lot of choice points along there the way. There are choice points. Okay. We wake up one day and we say, you know what? Even if I walk from here to the corner, if that's mm -hmm. as good as I can do today, I'm going to do that today. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to compare myself to the old normal. It's like, yeah, I used to be able to run miles. Look at me. I'm pathetic. We have to switch from the voice of self-criticism, mm -hmm. self-condemnation, looking at our old normal, comparing ourselves to that person, mm -hmm. and, and we have to switch to self-compassion. How long do you think Self-compassion, mm -hmm. it's, it's every day. Yeah. Yeah, I wake up and I'm, I'm, it's like Groundhog Day. Okay. <laughs> I look down two paths. I look down the path of despair. At the end of that path are both of my daughters saying, Dad, you know, you kind of, you, you, you quit. Mm -hmm. You know, you stop being mm -hmm. a father to both of us, 
I look down the other path and I see both of my daughters proud of me. Mm -hmm. My earth and angel daughters are saying, Dad, we would have understood if you'd quit. But you fought your way one breath at a time, one day at a time, back into life. And you made the rest of your life an expression of your love for mm -hmm. us. Now, how long did it take, though? Rather than your pain. How long mm -hmm. did it take, like though? That. I mean, sometimes people are like, whoa, you know, it's been six months. Uh, you know, let's get over it. Grief has a you life know? and a timetable all of its own. It's different for all of us. But if we start speaking the first day in the voice of self-compassion, kindness, encouragement, a hand up, we're down, we're destroyed, we're on the floor. Mm -hmm. Some of us are kicking ourse ourselves. Right. Get up. Come on, the glass is half full. Come on. And we're listening to other people whose messages are saying, get over it, get on with it. Right. And we can barely get up. So the voice of self-compassion says, puts his hand, his hand on our shoulders and says, with kindness, encouragement, and patience, you're doing the best you can. Come on, let's go for a walk to the corners. Would that be okay? It's it's patient, like it's loving. We're, we're loving on ourselves. Right? We have to. And let's like go out that. to the audience now and see if we can get great. some questions for you, Ken, great. on the audience loving on themselves. We've got a great audience here. Is our mic on? I hope so. Okay, let's get a question here. Are there some do's and don'ts of supporting someone who's grieving? Absolutely, and what a great question. How many of us are, are supporting somebody, somebody we love is grieving? We're not necessarily at the epicenter. They're at the epicenter. They're fighting for their lives. And we're trying to decide, I don't know what to do. What should I, you know, and the first do is a simple, I'm so sorry. It's quieting our own tendency to want to put a spin on things, to say something that takes away your pain. Mm -hmm. Let me quick take away your pain. It's to realize we can't fix. There's not a fix for every problem. There's not a pill for every pain. There's not a diversion for every moment of emptiness. That we need to just be with that person. That's the first do. And to listen attentively, to be a witness to what they're going through rather than try to fix them. A don't is to put a spin, to try to come up with some magical way. Hey, I'm going to say something. It's going to take away your other. Or I'm going to ask a question like, do you have other kids? Wrong, Zzz, wrong question. Because what does that send? What message does that send? When you say, it's like, you feel like saying, oh my goodness, I forgot I have another kid. Why am I so sad? Right. I have another one at home, you know. I so. think that one can replace Exactly. The they want exactly. to stop that grief. Um, Heidi always says something which I like. She says, um, I used to send a casserole and now I send myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Has anybody else got a question they'd like to give? Dr. Ken, here we go. You can say your name if you want to. Your first name. My name is Rebecca. Um, how did your your daughter grieve? Um, did she do, grieve differently than you did? And how were you able to support your your other daughter? Most important thing, if you if you Love pick, it. if it's you pick up question. page one, and Heidi said this to me. She said, "I said Heidi, what t touched you the most about the book?" And she said, "Your dedication of this book to Steffi, to your Earth daughter." Mm -hmm. um, my gratitude for her hanging in there with me as I fought my way one baby step at a time, mm -hmm. truly, back into life is, is unlimited. So Steffi definitely grieved, and we understand so little. Heidi will tell you a lot about this. We understand so little about the experience, and we as families have to embrace an ethic. The ethic we have to embrace is take the high road. After 9-11, we saw this. Mm -hmm. Families were tearing apart. We have to make our relationships with our families an expression of our love for the person we've lost, not of our rawness, our unknowingness, our, our impatience, and our desire to get rid of and get over the pain. Well, well even in the, in, the Jenna, in the Jenna Drug Center video, you have Steffi, Steffi yep. in there. Yep. So you really, you've not forgotten about her, and you've acknowledged that her grief is just as important and as hard as yours. Yep. And, and we need, we are so far behind on creating resources for siblings. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, the Gender Drug Center, we have groups for the little kids and the middle kids, but still it is very hard, and we haven't found a way to be successful in engaging the older siblings mm -hmm. and getting them involved, because their story is, they're dealing with grieving parents, uh, often who are pulling apart in different ways, 
I mean, it's, it's unimaginable what they're dealing with. And that story is so important to be told. And Steffi, thank goodness, has, has grown strong and has a voice, and she's become my teacher to tell me what she goes through as a, a, having lost her sister. And it changes all the time, as it does for me. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else have a question? Hi, my name is Chuck. Chuck. Uh, in dealing with the anniversary dates from year to year, does it change as it goes out? One, two, three, five, ten, fifteen years? And how long has it been for you, Chuck? Twenty-four years. Okay. Anniversaries are very tricky. From a perch in heaven, anniversaries don't exist. Uh, grief occurs both inside of time and outside of time. Anniversaries are very tricky invitations. They're invitations to be re-traumatized or invitations to celebrate. And I choose to celebrate Jenna's birthday rather than her death date. Everybody's different. But the anniversary is an invitation to be re-traumatized. And we must learn how to resist that invitation by keeping it simple. Sometimes I think about the day after the anniversary and I plan something special. Because what am I doing? I'm fooling my mind into thinking ahead that I am going to live the next day. This day will pass. Mm -hmm. And how do I use this in every day as an expression of my love, as a celebration of the essence of the person I love, whether it's their sense of humor, their dearness, their enthusiasm for living, whatever quality you cherish, in your son or daughter, your son, to have it be a celebration of that mm -hmm. rather than re-traumatizing yourself. Anybody else have another question? Mm -hmm. um, my name's Eliza. I'm a college student. And I uh, recently, my roommate lost her father this year. And I was wondering if you have any suggestions into offering support to someone who's grieving away from home as opposed to being with her family at that time. Yes. You're her buddy. You're her witness. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're even here answer, asking that question of all the things you could be asking lets me know that you hold her in your heart. And I think the idea of just being with her and allowing her to air out. A grieving person needs a safe space above anything. They don't need answers and they're, they're going to be asking questions. But a safe place to not be judged. Become that judgment-free zone where she can air out, where you're not there trying to fix or figure out, uh, which is what we the trap that we get into, but you're there and that you're asking open-ended questions. You know, the best, most powerful tool in communication is listening, and it's the art of asking the open-ended question that says, what do you think your options, what, do you, what are you thinking you might want to do? Or how could you stay in closer touch with your family? Or what's it like being so far from your family? Well, is it even harder in some ways? So asking that open-ended question can be so helpful. You're a healing presence as a friend and that means everything mm -hmm. to her. Well, thank you, everybody, the audience, for those questions. And thank you for being on the show today thank and for answering so all those questions and for all the work you're doing with the Gina Drex Center and being the person you are, Ken. You're fabulous. Thank you. Yes, Ken. Well, you thank you so much. So with. much. Thank we you. really, really thank appreciate you. you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, our next guest, Heidi, is going to be Patricia Loader. Uh, executive director of the Compassionate Friends, and as we said, a great friend of ours. And before we have her on, why don't we see a video about the Compassionate Friends, which, as we've said, is the largest grief support organization for bereaved parents, siblings, and grandparents in the world. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have not heard about it, so we want to shout out loud and clear for the help that, that this organization gives the world. Absolutely. Okay. Let me introduce you to TCF. We are a special organization serving the parents, grandparents, brothers and sisters of children gone too soon. Through a national network of outstanding volunteers, we devote ourselves to helping families deal with the death of a child at any age and from any cause. Our chapter leaders hold monthly meetings where those who have experienced the death of a child, grandchild, brother or sister may come and talk about their feelings remember and celebrate their loved ones and help one another with hugs and hope. It was that yearning to have
someone to tell my story and to try to find comfort. I've found um, validation. It gave me hope. It, it made me, I found friends and people that understood what I was going through and that did try and push me and rush me and like turn their backs on me. It's been an incredible source of strength and support for me and so I, I just love the organization. I think I'm a different person, not because of the death of my daughter, but because of the way I celebrate her life with really a compassionate way. And I felt overwhelmed, didn't know where to turn. And uh, I learned quickly through the compassionate friends that others, like yourself, uh, who've experienced that loss, could help me like no other. Come here. This is a place that people are going to befriend you and they're going to save you and give you hope. Well, Heidi, let's uh, introduce Pat Loader now. Absolutely. Hi, Pat. Hey, Pat. Hello. Good to see you. <laughs> Pat, it's so great to have you on the show today, and uh, you're uh, such an inspiration to everybody. You, you really, really are. are. Yeah, so she is. I know. She's amazing. Your spirit, your energy, and uh, your story mm -hmm. uh, is, is just, I mean, you have had unbelievable things happen and, and have been able to come through it, and, and what an inspiration. Can you talk about your kids a little bit and your, your story? I'd love to. Um, it was the first day of spring. Um, 1991 and we were on our way home my parents we had just lost my brother um, mm -hmm. six months before and I thought that perhaps if I helped them um, that would help fix them you know I was naive at that time and um, so I went over and was doing things at their house and trying to keep them company bringing my children with me and and we were on our way home um, my son and, and daughter um, Stephen was five at the time, Stephanie was eight, and we were ready to turn onto our street. And unbeknownst to me, there was a light down the street, um, and one motorcycle driver motioned to the others that the last one to the bar should buy. And the, the first one blew the light, and he zoomed past me, and I thought, wow, you know, and, but I started to make my turn, not knowing that the other two were just behind him. And I started to make the turn, and one of the uh, motorcycles hit my car in the side. My children were seated. Mm. Wow. Pushing it 26 feet sideways. Oh, jeez. Wow. And you ended so, up in the hospital. I did. And one of your yes. children died at the scene, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And one of them ended up in the hospital, and your husband had to go to another Right. City or whatever, right. right? She was, um, Stephanie was flown to the University of Michigan uh, Trauma Center, mm -hmm. and um, where my husband was taken um, by a family friend, and um, later they did test on her and said there was no brain activity. Wow. So he had to call me at the other hospital and ask if. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. We should turn off the machine. And wow. Yeah, incredible. Incredible devastation in your life. And then you went on. Well, well, that's the amazing part, Mom. I've got to say, this is so much for me to take in. I mean, to think about having your brother die, and six months later, you're in a car where both your children at the ages of five and eight die, all within a six-month period. I mean, you just wonder how does somebody ever find joy again? How do they transform their lives? That's why I think your story is so important for those out there that really don't know how they're going to do it. Absolutely. And don't believe that they ever will yeah. find anything but misery at this point. Right. And so then you went on? Uh, to find the compassionate friends, I did. Um, actually, it was a case of, you know, take me any place, just don't take me there, because I didn't want to admit that I was a bereaved parent. It was it was very painful mm -hmm. to even think about the fact that the kids had died. And, um, but sitting at a Compassionate Friends meeting, I heard somebody talk about that videotape that never went off in their head. And I thought, wow, somebody else has that videotape playing just like I do, mm -hmm. because I used to play 
the accident over and over in my head until it would, it, I would wake up screaming or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. And when I heard her say that she had that videotape, I thought, wow, I'm really not alone. And it really was a comfort to know that I wasn't alone, mm -hmm. that there were other people who felt um, that that same thing that I was feeling, those, you know, you kind of need that check, mm -hmm. so to speak, and um, it, it provided that for me. So it kind of normalizes your grief, because I know early on grief can feel really crazy. Oh, And absolutely. you're like, is this normal? Is this not normal? I feel like I don't even recognize myself anymore. And so being around other bereaved parents, it sounds like they got it. And, and you realize, yeah. okay, wait a minute, I'm not alone in this. Yeah. Other people have been there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you talked in the first segment about um, losing your friends um, right. or gaining friends that you never knew um, before the accident. Mm -hmm. um, that happened to us, you know. And the fact that um, I went to a compassionate friends meeting and nobody shushed me, you know. Mm -hmm. Nobody said, you know, you know you're dwelling on it. Um, you, you, you really shouldn't talk about it. You're just, you know, bringing up all those bad memories. But what they didn't know is those bad memories were up there in my okay. head anyways mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, Pat, how did you find the group? And I'm thinking for people out there who listen to the show, uh, you know, what is Compassionate Friends? And I think mm -hmm. people will be surprised to know what there are 650 chapters in mm -hmm. the United States. There's 650 chapters in the United States, in every state, in Puerto Rico, in Guam. Um, it's a network of chapters where it's peer to peer support. Um, we don't have professionals at the meeting. It's one bereaved family member to another. Um, and it really normalizes, and mm -hmm. you know that you're not alone through it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one of the things we were talking to you today, we had uh, Heidi and I had lunch with you. We were saying, because Heidi's a therapist and I'm a therapist, that you actually go to therapy and compassionate friends do, right? I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm, if you, if you want to do them both, you can. Oh, or absolutely. Just one. Um, I needed both. Right. You know, I just needed both. Um, after a while, obviously, I dropped the therapy portion. But it, you know, I'm not afraid to say that. You know, if you need therapy, mm -hmm. by all means, you should get therapy. Mm -hmm. And the other piece is that not all people do need therapy. Absolutely. But, you know, true. sometimes you mm -hmm. do. And, and I love the idea of Compassionate Friends. I love what it says. They say what? Um, you, that you need not walk alone. We need not walk alone. Others have been there and made it, and so can you. We need, you need not walk alone. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And, and uh, I love it. I go to some meetings, and they, you don't have to talk. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, no. people can either talk or not talk. Right. I mean, there's no, nobody cares, you know, they can pass or, or whatever. But one thing I love, honey, and you and I were talking about it, is the national conference. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's amazing. It is. Every year and there's a national conference. Mm -hmm. it, last year it was in Costa Mesa, this year, I should mm -hmm. say. Next year it's going to be in Boston. Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking, Ken Dreck was talking, that there's not a lot for siblings. Wow, there's a lot for siblings at the Compassionate Friends. Yes, the Compassionate Friends does well in including siblings and having a big sibling program. At the program. national conference. Yes. Well, the groups, it's kind of hard to get on a local group yeah. to get siblings. There are a few right. of them, but it's tougher. But at the national. Yep. It is the one great. place that siblings can go and be heard and have their loss validated. And we, we talk a lot, because I do a lot of sibling workshops, about what is different about our loss versus our parents' loss. Mm -hmm. And it's a place to go and, and be heard. And so, yeah, I love it. Those, those conferences are so powerful. And also, you had a unique situation in that you were a parent with no living children. Right. And uh, this is an opportunity for people to go and be around other parents who have mm -hmm. maybe suicide or no living children or, mm -hmm. you know, those all unique things, a lot of uh, mm -hmm. workshops and things. Mm -hmm. But let's stop and take some audience questions now. I'm sure the audience will have some questions about compassion. Okay. okay. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes. How do you find out? How do you find out where the meetings are, or how, how, how you know, if there's one in your city or where they meet, into times and all that. Okay. Um, the 
easiest way is to go on our um, chapter locator that's on our uh, website, compassionatefriends.org. We have a chapter locator. You can put your zip code in there, and it will find the nearest chapter for you. You can also call the office, and the office will do a referral. Um, in what ways does the uh, Compassionate Friends support teens in their grieving? Well, as Heidi said, the national conference we do, I think, a really good mm -hmm. job with the, with the teens. The individual chapters, sometimes it's more difficult to, to keep the sibling groups going. And I'm not exactly sure why that is, but um, the, at the national conferences, though, um, that is a big help. But there is the also a wonderful sibling Facebook page. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Absolutely. this is big. So yeah. the social media, if you've got any siblings out mm -hmm. there who you're wondering who to connect with, have mm -hmm. them go to Compassionate Friends to the sibling. Mm -hmm. uh, right. It's, it's the Compassionate Friends Sounds of the Siblings Facebook. It's a great place. And, and just to answer, I'm sorry, your name? Uh, Scotty. Just to answer Scotty's question here, um, the, I love all the stuff they do for teens at these at these conferences because it's not just talking because you know sometimes teens don't want to talk and sometimes they don't feel like talking mm -hmm. and sometimes they, they might be like men of few words so there's a lot of doing stuff you know activities and going out and having fun and going to Disneyland this year so there's a lot of events and you know the thing about three siblings just like three parents when we're all together we so get it that it transcends words sometimes we don't need to talk just being in the room with other people that have been where you have been is so healing and I think yes. that's one of the amazing things and the siblings make lifelong friendships forever anybody else yes my name is Marty and um, is compassionate friends for newly bereaved parents or do you have parents going in you know five years out after the death of a child it's for either um, will I have actually seen where a bereaved parent will come from the funeral and hear about the compassionate friends and go to a meeting. Now that's a little soon usually. Um, everybody's different when they want to come to their first meeting, but some people might be there that are five years down the road, ten years down the road, but they're really there to help mm -hmm. and the new, more newly bereaved to get that sense of normalcy back in their life. And also the international, uh, the national candle lighting every year. Uh -huh. uh, is it the second week in December? Second Sunday second in December. Second Sunday in December is amazing because mm -hmm. people will come who are, you know, years and years bereaved because it gives them a kind of once a year opportunity to remember their child and families will come and those are, are, are big events. So, yeah. And I love yes. the Compassionate Friends because it's there if you have an anniversary or say mm -hmm. somebody gets married in the family and your kids are not there after 20 years and you need to go tell somebody about it. Mm -hmm. There's this group that you can go uh, tell mm -hmm. about it that's interested in it. But Heidi, I, I, I'd like to end our questions now because I okay. want Pat to talk about where she is today okay, and about your family today because your two kids are leaving for college. Yes, they are, they are as we they speak. Are. As we speak. Um, I have two subsequent, subsequent children, a boy and a girl. Who were born after Stephanie and Stephen died. That's right. Mm -hmm. They were born after they died, and um, they are going away to college this week. Mm. And um, so it's exciting for our household. Mm -hmm. um, it, somebody asked if, if I felt uh, that empty nest, and I don't. It's... I feel the great pride. I'll miss them like mm -hmm. crazy while they're gone. But I feel that great pride that they've made. They're, you know, they're setting off on their life's journey. And, and uh, I don't know. I'm just really excited about it for them. That's great. That's great. I'm wondering, how do you keep um, Stephanie and Steve uh, alive in the memory of Chris and Katie? We always talk about mm -hmm. Steph and Steve in our family, and you know there are pictures up, and and they've always been a, a part of our family from the time the the kids were born. Um, I always made sure that I told their teachers that if they drew extra children into the drawings, mm -hmm. um, 
at you know when you draw the family picture. Oh, I love that. Um, I always told the 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 um, teachers that it was true um, that they could expect that, and they would draw little angels in the sky. Um, because they were so real. And them. I think that's mm -hmm. all of our role, that's one of our major roles in this room is to keep the memories of those that we've loved and lost alive. Yeah. And so, you know, that our kids, et cetera, will know, like you said, they know their siblings, even though mm -hmm. they've never met them. Mm -hmm. My children know their uncle, even though they've never met him, mm -hmm. through, through me and through the memories. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's important. Mm -hmm. It is. and and. Uh, they become more precious. You know, one of the things people are always afraid about is that they'll forget. Yeah. But I have to tell people out there, you people who are newly bereaved, the memories become more precious mm -hmm. and you remember more things. Yeah. And with Facebook now, Heidi, hasn't everybody been commenting on Scotty lately? Absolutely. The, th the thing about remembering more over time is that the grief no longer gets in the way of the memories. That's mm -hmm. right. I exactly. used to think of Scott and I get so overwhelmed with grief yes. that I couldn't go there. Yes. Now I can go and visualize him and remember those wonderful times with him. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. You don't remember how they died. Right. You remember how they lived. Absolutely. And that's when you get to that point, that's when you know that you're on a healing path. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I know, um, going to a compassionate friends meeting, I'll have to say, is can be very traumatizing the first time it can for be. people out yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we really recommend, what do you recommend about that? Um, we recommend that they attend at least three meetings mm -hmm. to see if it's really for them. That first meeting, y you go in there with ex expectation that that somehow there's going to be a magic answer and you're going to not feel the pain. Mm -hmm. But you listen to the other people in the room and a lot of times you take home, you know, some of that pain with you. So knowing what going back knowing what to expect on the second or the third time um, really does help to to make that transition and and know that you know what to expect that the dynamics are different at at the different meetings and it really you know if you give yourself that chance it really does help okay so I, I really want to go to compassionate friends meeting mm -hmm. There are 650 chapters, right? Mm -hmm. It's a big country. There's not a chapter in every community. What if I want to start a chapter? And, mm -hmm. you know, how do you do that? Can you do that? Can I do that? Absolutely. We'd love to have you start a chapter. Um, we want you at least 18 months along in your grief. Um, the reason being is we want you to go through those first. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to help somebody else when you are in such heavy grief yourself. So be at least 18 months along and um, have some other people to help you mm -hmm. start the chapter. And, um, and head on to your website mm -hmm. and find out all about it. Absolutely. I love mm -hmm. it. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's thank you. so great, Pat. And thank you, Pat. It's fabulous to see you. Yes. Thank you. Heidi, our next guest is going to be somebody who we're very fond of, Chris Donahoe, right? Absolutely, and he's got amazing music, and he dedicates, as we said before, all his music to his beautiful brother, Terrence. Absolutely, and we heard him at the Compassionate Friends National Conference, speaking we, of that. We did. He's, he's got fabulous music. It is so healing, and you know, music hits you at such a deep level. It really opens up your heart and opens up your emotions and opens up the memories. And we're going to hear him sing about gratitude. Gratitude is a big thing for us, right? It is, and, and finding gra gratitude in everything, like being grateful today that we're here with all these amazing guests. Absolutely. Being grateful that you can put, match your socks in the morning. Okay, so with that, it looks like we have got it. We're going to turn it over to Chris and hear his song. Great. I can race through the day, can live in the rush. And what can you do? What can you do? I can lie in the dark, say life isn't fair. And what can you do? What can you do? But teach me everything. And the only thing in 
every brilliant day The only thing, the only thing When it all is stripped away give you my money, can lend you a hand, and what do you do, what do you do, I can give you a kiss, can give you a song, and what do you do, what do you do. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for show. having me. That yeah. was amazing. That was fabulous. Thank you so thank much. You. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> gratitude. I love Terrence's attitude about life. I mean, he had gratitude even while he was dying, which I think is incredible and speaks to him. And I love, I've got to show this to the audience because I love this as a picture of him. That is Terrence in Paris in 1992. And we had lots of photos of Terrence jumping. He just had this, mm -hmm. he wanted to be photographed in the air flying. So it, it's, uh, it really captures yeah. his essence. Yeah. It really does. And he was a physician, right? He was. He was a first year uh, surgical resident. I finished med school and um, was doing what he loved. He loved being a surgeon. He mm -hmm. loved solving problems um, and finding that way to, to help somebody. Mm -hmm. and, and he was doing it and was really thriving when he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Yeah. And um, that began a, a almost six-year battle with the disease that took his life. Mm -hmm. wow. and, uh, but he was determined to live life fully, even though it was uh, taking his life. Mm -hmm. And in a way, um, it was an opportunity to, to see how to live and mm -hmm. appreciate life. And he taught me so much, taught my siblings so much, my family. And I really see um, a huge gift that he left us, a legacy of his love. And gratitude is the heart of that. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, I, I've lived a great life. I have no regrets. And I'm thankful for you. So yeah. what else can I do but to, to use that gratitude to get through every day and to spread it? Right. And, uh, it, it would be doing a disservice to his, to his life not to. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing message for everybody out there. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, what would you like the world to know about sibling loss? I think um, 
in, in my case, you know, it's very sad mm -hmm. that Terrence is gone, but I can't forget the gift of mm -hmm. having been able to say goodbye to him. Mm -hmm. It's a long battle, and that song, Gratitude, came out of a lot of guilt I was feeling about maybe have not have been the best brother, mm -hmm. and having the opportunity to really talk to him and, and have all the conversations you want to have, say everything you want to say, mm -hmm. um, helped me, help my siblings, help my family get through it and move forward, which is what he wanted. And as far as uh, my siblings, it's brought us closer. Mm -hmm. And we've leaned on each other. I think we've, it, it has brought us together in a new way. And we try to celebrate mm -hmm. him. We talk about him. Um, you know, I injured my knee last year. My sister called and said, oh, Terrence would have a field day with this. We would, <laughs> would love to, to know what you're doing for your knee. I mean, so I we that. keep him alive and, yeah. and by having conversations. And, you know, what Ken said uh, really resonated with me about the conversation. If mm -hmm. you're having it, it just just gets you, helps you get through and move forward and keep, keep living. And, and keeping his memory alive as yeah. well. And I love how you and your siblings really appreciate each other. Because you realize, look, the sibling relationship, you don't take it for granted. And I feel the same way with my sisters. We're very, very close because we realize we're lucky to still have each other mm -hmm. on the earth. Yeah. So that's a whole other message. Yeah, and I think it's, you, it's, a, it's a hard wake-up call, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, you, like Ken was saying, you, your life, you're living it, everything's going well. Then this happens and you mm -hmm. realize, wow, I'm, I'm not special. Right. This mm -hmm. can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... I do appreciate my siblings and my family mm -hmm. more than I ever have. Mm -hmm. And um, there's always a positive in this, in this loss. There always is. And mm -hmm. I've just decided that I'm going to try and find every positive, And it's in there. There's always the sadness. It never goes away. But uh, You know so what I really love? I'm sitting here just enjoying this as a parent. Because I know the parents in this audience, and I know those parents that are out there in TV land are worried about their kids. You know, you worry about yourself and trying to get over the loss, but you're really worried that it's going to destroy your kids' lives and that, that they'll never be the same. And you two are just fabulous examples of what is it, I, how do you say it doesn't, it defines you, but it doesn't destroy you? Yeah, because I do hear that over and over. That is parents' biggest question when I work with parents. Will my kids, I, their childhoods are forever destroyed, their lives are forever destroyed. You know, they'll never be happy. You know, look what's happened to them. And like you said, look, even though it's a horrendous thing, we can still find joy again and we can mm -hmm. still find gratitude and positive things in, in our lives. Right. Now, now, one question I want to ask you guys to talk about a little bit here is taking care of your parents. I love the fact that you guys are talking about your siblings, and uh, but yeah. sometimes uh, parent, kids are told, uh, you know, how are your parents doing? You've got to be strong for them, right? Mm -hmm. I, I remember early on, and that uh, what my mom needed most of all was just to talk mm -hmm. and to just talk and let me listen to whatever was happening in her life, mm -hmm. what her friend, how her friends were reacting or not reacting, and um, because I didn't know what to, how to comfort her. I, this was my, I didn't understand. So um, I hope it was helpful. Yeah, I hope it was just, <laughs> <laughs> and just to be there because, um, I, I wanted to do my part to be to just to be support her without being judgmental, without having the answers because I didn't have them. Right. Well, I'm sure you did. And we are going to hear your next song, which I love from this album of yours, March. And by the way, March is not the month of the year. I love it is because it's March to your own tune. Mm -hmm. And beautiful bread. Love this song, Chris. And I'm looking forward to hearing you. It's sing also it. the month Terrence was born. Oh, wow. the month he was born. So we're going to go out Wonderful. with the song March, and we're going to close the show now. And uh, then we'll go out with Chris singing the song March. And thank you for being on the show today, Chris. It's been great. And Heidi and I want to thank our audience. Thank we you, Chris. Thank, we want to thank Pat. We want to th thank Ken. We want to thank everybody. And we particularly want to thank the Mid Peninsula Media Center in Palo Alto, California, for going to all the energy to help us put on this fabulous show. Yes, and this show was brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation with the mission of helping people find hope after loss. Please visit us at opentohope.com where you can listen to Open to Hope Radio, read articles, and view our books. And now we're going to hear from Chris. The 
light and dark a blur Pray to some cruel saboteur And you march And some wars can't be won Somehow you knew it all along And you march You don't lay your weapons down Your feet numb to the ground March to your own drummer March beautiful brother The beat of your heart will march And meaning distilled To simple truths and will When you march Lost is any choice, but lost is not your voice, and you march. And what's broken can't disguise a tireless parade. with the rhythm of love on your mind let peace be the place that